Hello, welcome to API Days Helsinki, and we have here Geir from Google. And what is the life hack or learning experience that you want to share for us in these weird times that we are living? I think I think something that I've, uh, that's occurred to me to be very important important is actually nourishment and how we nourish ourselves, and that, that can come in a lot of different ways. But for me, uh, and I'm trying not the only one, that I've, I've uh, taken up sourdough baking again. But in addition mm-hmm. to that, I'm, I'm brewing more beer. I'm um, I'm making more stews. Um, so there's just a lot more food experimentation, and we're kind of rotating in the household between me, my wife, my daughter, and my son, and cooking different meals to make sure that we're all really fed. And that, that makes a nice separation between the, the work that goes on in the home and the other things that might go on in the home, rest and food and otherwise. Yeah, well, that's very important. So that's actually why we are, uh, I'm sitting now in my garden here. You have those guitars behind you. So actually my husband uses the grill during meetings to yeah. cook some food <laughs> while talking in the meeting. And I have my garden batch there if you saw that, but yeah, it's like very important part of trying to cope with this. My my son does the dishes though, so uh, there needs to be a division of labor that is very important <laughs> in any team. But hey, um, so sometimes your children power your your um, day, but now you have API power digital ecosystem. Slightly different story here, and so take it away, Gary. Yes, thank you. So. Um, uh, I- as I was introduced, my name is Gail Scherset. I'm a tech strategist. I work for Apogee. And I've been working for Apogee since 2014. And I've been working with APIs and kind of building and helping business transform themselves uh, since a little before that. So I think I started really engaging with the world of REST APIs in 2013, uh, maybe even 2012-ish, uh, when I really began to experiment with these things. So I want to kind of make this relevant, time relevant. So we're going to talk about uh, kind of the spread of COVID-19. And I'm going to make the, the argument that that is a crisis of kind of big data proportions. And then that really we think about this disease uh, as, a, as a disease in itself. But a lot of the problems we're having in terms of how we're going to combat the disease, how we're going to find when it's the right time to you know, uh, lighten restrictions, if we have any, uh, is it, all around the amount of data that we have on what's going on. And so we think right now, or up until COVID-19, we thought that we were in the age of assistance. You know, I can ask my phone uh, to give me information on things. More and more apps are becoming available. And let's be clear, all of those things are driven by APIs. But is that really the case, Um, especially now when we have this type of problem? um, uh, Are are we really enabled in the right way to, to be assisted from all these APIs and all these different players on the market? Something that's very near and dear to our heart is this idea of a impactful business experience, and that's gonna come for something that we call the digital value chain. And as that's illustrated here, we've got things on the far right, cloud services, ML, AI, digital um, insights, and so on. So different types of backends that, that represent a service that ultimately will offer something impactful to the user you have on the far left. In the center there, uh, I've I've drawn up Apigee, um, obviously near and dear to my own heart, but um, any API management system can sit there delivering a fantastic experience to a developer. And that's important because that developer is the actual customer of any APIs you build. And that the job of that developer is to deliver a fantastic experience to the left, to whatever user, business partner, even internal consumer of your APIs that you have. Um, uh, and to spend their time thinking about that. And what we don't want that developer to do is to spend time thinking around the APIs themselves. They should be as easy to be found and and subscribed to as possible. I wanna switch now to a different type of uh, of value chain, just kind of a traditional linear value chain uh, that looks like an internal chain or a pipe of production. So during the industrial revolution and maybe fast forwarding to the, the mid 20 or early 20th century, when we really see assembly lines on board, We have these kind of simplistic linear uh, step-by-step setup to get something um, built and value, you know, something of value built so that we can ultimately deliver it to some kind of consumer. But what's interesting is that that whole world has been disrupted by APIs. So if we we look around these, uh, many of these other players that we know and love, so if I look at a Facebook, they um, are a purveyor of, of a bunch of different types of content that we create. And then we're also the viewers of, those, of that content. Uh, uh, if I look at Google, Google provides um, a bunch of search capabilities for me to go and find things. And then if I have my own service, then Google itself provides an indexer that will find this so I can just discover that. 
And so this linear kind of value chain has been disrupted. So it's not as simple as, as, as the, the traditional business model changing. We're actually changing how a subscriber and a consumer come together and meet up in order to find this different type uh, of service and to get something useful out of it. And that has some significant impacts on market cap. So if I just look at a couple of examples here, and we take something like Uber, again, founded in, 20, in 2009, roughly 7,000 employees, but a market cap upwards of $80 billion. Um, significantly higher than, say, something like BMW, which has you know an order of magnitude more employees, really one and a half, um, but a lower market cap, right? And, and, and part of the reason here is because of the way the, the value chain ultimately is implemented in these scenarios. A BMW, a Marriott, a Kodak in this case, which obviously doesn't really exist in that form anymore, those built things in a linear fashion to be delivered to a known audience. The difference between that and Airbnb is that Airbnb is asking the supply chain pieces to come and meet the people that want to get access to anything that's been sourced. And the, 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 and the kind of network or the roads that, that connect all these things together, those are APIs. I'm going to switch to a moment and talk uh, about something related to data uh, that I'm going to tie back together with this again in a minute. And I'm going to bring up a, a gentleman named Abraham Valt. So Abraham Valt was a Hungarian mathematician. Uh, he was actually part of the then Austro-Hungarian Empire. In fact, I think he's from Cluj, Napoca, uh, modern-day Romania. And he fled with his family. He was of Jewish descent to the U.S. And while he was there, he joined the war effort. And so specifically, he was asked by the army at the time that was working together with the Royal Air Force out of the UK to, to find a better way to armor their aircraft. So they had aircraft that were going to fight in the war. Um, they saw the returning aircraft and they came back with all these bullet holes as you can see here illustrated in that image. And he was put to task to find a way to armor the planes so that they were more likely to return home with less bullet holes, but not so over encumbered with, with this armor that they lost maneuverability because that would have an adverse effect. They would be even more likely to go down then. And uh, the answer that uh, Abraham Vault went back with was uh, much to the surprise of the, the army gentleman that had, that had given him this task was actually where you want to be um, reinforcing these planes is where you don't see any bullet holes at all. And uh, they didn't believe them. They went some back and forth, but this kind of, uh, cemented or helped ground one area of research that we like to think of as survivorship bias. The army, in concert with the information they were getting back from the United Kingdom of the Royal Air Force, was only providing them information on the planes that had returned. But Abraham Vault knew there was a greater data set. There was a data set of planes that never made it back at all. And he deduced through his statistical analysis that actually it's that tail end of the fuselage and the engines that were most likely the, mo the best places to reinforce with armor. And that in fact, where you see a lot of these bullet holes is where the planes were more resilient. And so that's not where we needed uh, to add additional armor for them because it was going to ruin the maneuverability. And that means that the, the missing planes, so the planes that they didn't even know anything about, were in fact a data set in their own right. And that's a very powerful learning, I think, because uh, there, there's a lot of data that we think we have, and if we have a data lake or if we have a bunch of services, but there may be a bunch of interactions that we simply don't know anything about. Um, and not all problems are as simple or as facile as a down bomber. Uh, so we, uh, and if I like to try to reconnect this back to, to COVID for a second, we can see that we have these COVID um, outbreaks, I've called them bombs here, um, uh, that explode and it causes different hotspots to rise and fall, and those, have their own impact also on supply chains. So how are we sourcing materials uh, for our core business? Um, and by the way, how are consumers going to find uh, those different pieces? And all this has a tremendous impact on predictability and it affects scales at a global level. Um, and again, I would say that all this can be traced back to a profound lack of data. So while in Abraham Valt's case, he knew uh, how many the total number of planes were and could, could, could deduce from that well, which ones were going down uh, and which ones weren't and, there, and therefore make the kind of predictions that he did. What we really need to do is API enable uh, every inch of these uh, of the supply chain, uh, both in terms of how we're sourcing materials to build or make or construct what we're making, all the way out to the consumers so that we're not impacted in the same way by this crisis. So if I go back to think about testing in the virus, we can improve our rate of testing. We can serology tests that will reveal uh, different patients that have recovered. 
Uh, and perhaps uh, all this testing and data can provide us a perfect model for how we can map the spread of this disease. And I can think about this in, in terms of business. If we can increase the data that we're getting, so we know where the supply chain and logistics data is coming from, look at market trends. If there's a hot spot here, I can't, it's probably not where I should be spending my marketing dollars to deliver any of my, uh, my new, uh, uh, to, to my source goods should be sold there. I can analyze for new market opportunities and so on. All this data has to come from somewhere and APIs are a way that's gonna power that. And that API data is gonna come from kind of building whatever your core business does today and making it an ecosystem player that can branch out into these other economies and gather data so you can reuse it. And I would say the ultimate goal here in terms of this type of ecosystem data combined with APIs is that we wanna build a virtuous cycle. So we've got partners, we've got internal developers, we've got third party developers, all those consumers that I mentioned earlier that are on the left side of that digital value chain that ultimately are consuming some sort of service. That service is gonna be a consumable API. The usage of that API itself creates more and more API data. That API data can be, uh, you can run, uh, you can derive new information on it in the form of machine learning, take your existing data, map all that together and create a whole new bundle of APIs that can drive new, new and more interesting interactions. Again, reconnecting to those consumers that you have on the left to get more and more value of everything you're creating there. So we think about where are we coming to, in, into this picture? So Google's network receives 10 billion API calls a second or over, and I believe this is 86 quadrillion, 400 trillion, uh, calls every day. And that's a, that's a significant amount of, of data that we're processing. And that data itself, uh, sorry, API calls per day, that, that those API calls themselves drive their own data resources that we can reconnect to that same type of richness cycle. So I mentioned earlier that ultimately your developers are the actual consumers of your API and they're your real customers. And so if they're your customers, you have to market to them in the, pro in the proper way. So this is just a quote from a customer of Apogee's uh, uh, Mark Inelli, a single developer always has the potential to be working on the next big thing and become our next big enterprise partner, and we needed a way to reach them. And that's precisely it, that rather than always thinking about a kind of linear value chain where you guys are producing something, even if it's a software thing, uh, to some ultimate consumer, we want to enable an ecosystem where the suppliers and the sourcers are meeting the consumers in their own right, and all we have to do is keep that marketplace open. And uh, in order to, embra to embrace properly that uh, you know, uh, aspiring group of next generation uh, uh, developers for you, you need a developer portal. So a developer portal should provide easy access, well-documented APIs. Of course, you want to implement the 555 rule. If you're not familiar with that, it's the, the notion that it should take five seconds for a developer to find an API, five minutes into the first hello world. And I think it's, it's five hours or five days to, to bring the first proper API to market. If you do this and you build a community with blogs and forums and facts around this, that creates an area where the developers feel at home so they can concentrate on providing value to their customers instead of worrying and wondering about how your APIs themselves are going to work. Along with that is you should invest in this idea of API evangelism. So you want to support your APIs with marketing and promotion. So you want to treat these developers as customers in their own right. Um, sell them on adoption, provide them easy uh, tools and examples, by the way, and create a feedback loop so that if they have questions, you guys can answer those questions. Um, and, uh, and then the next person that comes along can read whatever that answer is so that um, they, they can get up and running on their own. And finally, uh, you want to monitor performance, making sure that uh, these APIs are working properly. And with that there, um, we can move on to championing the business value. So this business value piece is all around kind of creating the right types of, of KPIs. So we wanna keep track of revenue, the kind of customer experience we're having. Again, those customers to a large extent are the developers that are consuming your APIs, but sometimes it could be their customers as well. Uh, expand on that growth and kind of speed up partner onboarding. Because if, if we're gonna develop an ecosystem that we need to be enabled so the partners can go and sell our goods, our services, our know-how, everything that we have, on our behalf, and then everybody um, benefits from that kind, of, uh, that kind of setup. And if we're gonna make that work in the long term, we have to manage iteration. So we need to, to plan how we're gonna do this. Versioning suddenly becomes super important for how you're gonna think about these, in particular the APIs. And we're gonna make uh, additional features that we can wrap into an API product. 
So we might take any given API and reuse it in a multiple or an array of different products uh, and for different use cases. And then we can take those products and market them to particular market segments, just like we would any other product in their own right. Finally, I want to just mention monetization. So a lot of our customers love the fact that we have a platform that supports monetization pre and post paid and that we can do things like profit sharing. Generally, I say that it's, it's probably a good idea to focus on monetization after you've gotten your API program up and running and you've kind of explored the market that you're initially interfacing with. But, but do consider it. Um, because in particular, an API ecosystem that has an opportunity for profit sharing, um, it provides an on-ramp for partners that encourages them to get up and running as quickly as possible, and then everybody wins from that type of setup. Okay, so we've talked about productizing these APIs, we've talked a little bit about ecosystems, engaging with partners, and kind of how that developer is the most important piece. So now I wanna talk a little more about kind of next steps and what it, kind of what some of this can all mean. So digital ecosystems um, could account for more than $60 trillion by 2025, or more than 30% of the global corporate revenue. That is a significant amount of money. It, it's, it's, a, it's hard to believe that we're gonna grow to that volume so quickly, see what happens with uh, the COVID-19 uh, COVID impact on that. But that's from 2018, uh, McKinsey uh, study. But digital journeys sometimes, especially if you haven't done it already, begin like entering a foreign market. So there might be distances between uh, your whatever market you're in today and the foreign market that you're entering, especially if it's a proper foreign market. Cultural differences, uh, languages could be involved with that, um, uh, different types of demographics, social values and norms. There could be administrative differences, how do the legal system work here versus there, obvious geographic differences in terms of, uh, both in terms of how that geography will directly impact the business that you want to run in said foreign economy. But even just different differences in terms of how far away, time zones, human resources and management are going to have an impact on that. And then, of course, economic differences. You know, are, are you moving into a market that has a similar economy as the one you're starting from or is it completely different? And we think that uh, moving into a digital marketplace is similar to moving into a foreign marketplace. And so you're going to have different types of focuses. So if I'm trying to adopt to a, a business to a foreign country, I'm going to have to adapt it. So I pick the right products that are going to make sense there. Maybe I do some, some design work to change a little bit what they're going to work like. In terms of externalization, I might look for a specific group of partners or alliances that I can make in the new country uh, to kind of make this successful. And of course, I want to be able to innovate this. So I'm able to change this. I want to change process that's going to be agile so I can do this quickly. Uh, and I can recombine parts of my parent business with any kind of local elements that are there. If I switch this to an API way of thinking about this, it's still it's pretty similar. I'm, I'm still going to think about a number of products that I want to align for the, the the given digital ecosystem I'm moving into, um, and um, and those might be you know tailor fit for for whatever that journey is going to look like. Again, I'm going to design, so I want an API first approach to modulize these services and how they're going to work. I'm going to externalize them by trying to create API enabled partnerships. So I'm going to embrace this community of partners that are going to help make me successful. Um, and by the way. These might be partners that are, that are selling on my behalf, this is gonna come up later, but without marketing who I am, uh, who my own agency is on, um, on their own right, because at the end of the day, I'm expanding and I'm really what I'm, over, what I'm really looking for is an overall market cap increase. And I'm gonna innovate. I wanna make these, this an API first approach, so I think about my APIs first, how they're productized, um, uh, as opposed to thinking about the end, the end services, because I'm actually hoping that by externalizing to those partners, they're gonna drive that on my behalf. And so, this means that a lot of times your API strategy and your brand strategy need to be aligned. And I'm just, just some thought on this is that a, a lot of our customers insist or, or truly believe that everything they're going to do in the API economy needs to be tightly bound with their own marketing and, and brand recognition. And that could be true, but, but sometimes you can get a lot, you can, you can make a, a, a significant impact by giving up on that dream. So we can transform that capability to add more partners if we just kind of let the long tail take that from us and we stop worrying about that as much. And I give you an idea of that. Um, this is DBS, just an idea of this is a bank that, uh, of ours in, uh, in APAC. And um, what they basically chose to do was to API, API enable their ecosystem so much that it was very easy for partners uh, to involve or to, to start using their APIs to build their own products and services on the back of the products and services that DBS have built. 
And by doing that, they became one of the top 100 uh, ASEAN uh, banks uh, 2011 to 2019. Um, and they did that while losing their brand recognition. Um, and at the end of the day, they were okay with that because of the significant impact it had on their bottom line. So an API can have all kinds of different payoffs. Uh, we could think new sales, uh, different types of interactions, all these different types of journeys. Uh, external developers begin to build API and they're paying you to use them. We can get a whole new partners, uh, set of partners that are using our APIs, perhaps in a new market that we've never been involved in before, um, uh, and so on and so forth. So there's all kinds of different payoffs that we can see in terms of this. So I'm gonna just focus for a minute now on one example. Now I've had to anonymize this so we can't, uh, so I'm not specific, specifically talking about a particular agency, but let's imagine what a pizza company can tell us about digital transformation. So if we have a, one of the largest pizza companies in the world, 16,100 store locations, 85 countries, and over almost $14 billion in gross sales in 2018. Uh, they were the 2018 Tech Accelerator of the Year, 15 different digital ordering services, and 65% of their sales were done using digital ordering channels. So this is a, this is a, a company that we think of as doing something very physical that's clearly embraced a, a technological way of looking at the world. So what they needed was a, a new way to, to quickly create new tools. They wanted a quick way to grow new revenue and ordering platforms, but they were also very ready and willing to give up 100% of their brand recognition by en enabling uh, the sale of the pizzas they were creating to go through different markets, channels that they had no direct impact upon. And by doing that, they saw 117% increase in overall revenue. And also 65% of all sales were done via these new digital ordering channels. And that meant that they had 20 different ways that you could order a pizza, uh, including 75% of those from international markets that were featuring online ordering. And it literally meant that you could use a channel like Facebook Messenger to go and order a pizza from this provider, get that pizza delivered, and never ever interact directly with something uh, that from a consumer perspective at least, directly had anything to do with their own brand recognition name. And um, with that, I'm gonna thank you guys very much for listening to me today, and uh, I'll hand it back off. Thanks. Thank you. Great presentation, and oh, I wouldn't have so many questions and comments, but I'll try to limit them. So uh, first question is about that brand recognition. I think it's a hugely important thing because I've seen that as being one of the showstoppers actually for, well, not maybe developing APIs, but exposing APIs to others. And do you think that that kind of pizza strategy is a good um, strategy to every company? all types of companies? Is there somebody who should not give up their brand recognition? I, I think I think it might depend on kind of how developed you are in terms of a player in a, in a given space. So mm -hmm. I, 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 I don't think it's a one size fits all. So I don't think it's necessarily the case that every company should abandon their brand recognition and go mm -hmm. full on um, in, in, into, into that space. And actually with the pizza example, they kind of did it 50%. So they mm -hmm. opened up, they opened up how they were how their customers were going to be able to interact with them to channels that they didn't own. And, and by the way, those channels with their own branding around it, right? So I gave the Facebook Messenger example. Yeah. That's so actual like white labeling, white labeling pizza, basically. Correct. Correct. <laughs> but, but still with, uh, with everyone knowing and understanding really who the employer was versus that DBS example where the, uh, that, that Asian bank literally um, anonymized completely how those services were running so that people yeah. had no idea. Okay. Uh, I think so. So there's a spectrum there, right? From between keeping some part of your of your market recognition, your brand recognition, and eliminating it completely, so that you have as wide a space as possible. Mm -hmm. I, I think different industries will see a different uh, a yeah. different impact and different story there in terms of what that actually means. Yeah, because I ha I have experience in in some of some industries, and for example, the retail sector would be very high pressed to kind of let their brand recognition go because they are kind of the the top wolf in a way <laughs> there and they would be using other other companies APS but there could be something that they could give out of course but there there it's it's a tougher story but I think that I loved really the example that you had about API uh going API way is like basically going to a foreign market because um well I've seen companies struggle actually with going to a foreign market, <laughs> in, in not just APIs, but a real foreign market. But there, there are definitely some similarities there. So um, do you think that th that is something that 
kind of the skills if if you already are very global or if you have successfully gone to a new market then you could adapt those skills to kind of and be a more successful player in an API I, I, world. and a lot of that is 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 part and parcel to the idea of thinking your about your APIs as products mm -hmm. right so if if you've already made the journey to a foreign market Probably when you did that, you, you you had some product thoughts and marketing thoughts and go-to-market thoughts in terms of what that was going to look like. And if you're already, incidentally, you already have a set of APIs that you're using all over the world, um, then then those are probably active in particular channels, mm -hmm. in particular economies, and in particular scales, right? The moment yeah. that we want to think, mm, it's time to change that. We're going to change how all that works. Uh, I, I think that becomes a conversation very analogous to the foreign market one. I'll, I'll give you a, another example without naming mm -hmm. the company. So I know I know a company that's in the the, the oil business, yeah. um, and and they and they make equip. They don't drill the oil themselves, so they make equipment to drill oil. Um, and, and part of what they want to do is become not only a player that's using APIs to improve how that business works, how they're monitoring mm -hmm. equipment. So there's an IoT story there and a data mm -hmm. story affecting the data. But they want to open it up to their competition. Yeah. They realize they're never going to be the only player in the business. So they want to create a generic set of APIs that allows their competition to do the same types of monitoring and data collection that they do themselves. And then if they do that, they get to at least own the ecosystem. Uh, so mm -hmm. every dollar they lose to competition, they're still winning market share because they're going over their own API uh, set up around it. Yeah, I've also been in the oil, oil or an energy sector in another The place where they are going to be something else, but hey, good uh, talk, and I and I really love the way that you connected the market and uh, marketing brand, uh, kind of very businessy things to APIs and and kind of like you you emphasize the role of developers as a customer, which is something we we all all share that the pain that you need to do that but then of course not forgetting that you need to tell about the apis to your kind of normal customers to right do so put so, are there if not there anywhere else uh thank you a lot and um welcome to helsinki in kind of physical <laughs> way someday yes thank you yes i look forward to it Bye-bye.